my great pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Katy Rezvani. Katy um, uh, received her MD degree at UCL and then uh, a PhD in immunology at Imperial College in London and a postdoc at NIH. And she is today the Chief of Section of Cellular Therapy, Director of Translational Research and Director of the GMP Facility MD, MD Anderson Cancer Center. And she's really a pioneer in uh, uh, MK-based uh, uh, cell therapy. So thank you, Kathy, for being here. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. And thank you, Kiara, for the kind introduction. It's really wonderful to be here. I always love coming back to London. And also, you know, we've been working on getting this uh, meeting together for, for the last couple of years. So again, post-COVID, it's lovely to see everybody. So we're going to change gears and talk about natural killer cells. But before I do that, um, uh, my disclosures, so I'd like to um, make the audience aware that uh, the CAR-19 and K program that I will uh, touch on briefly, uh, as well as actually BCMA, CAR and K and four other targets were licensed by MD Anderson to Athimed, also, sorry, to Takeda. Also, I will be showing some data on a combination of a bispecific engager and NK cells, and that was uh, licensed by MD Anderson to Athimed. So uh, I don't have to go over the history of CAR T cells. So there were multiple really elegant presentations at this meeting. But suffice it to say that autologous CAR T cells for um, autologous CAR T cells for um, a number of uh, B cell malignancies um, include, and also a multiple myeloma were, uh, F were granted FDA approval. Um, in the last five years or so. Uh, what's important to note is all of these are autologous with responses really ranging anywhere from 45% or greater than 90% depending on, on, the, on the types of disease. So really exciting and a paradigm shift in, in the field. Uh, having said that, uh, autologous um, uh, products have a number of limitations that uh, Professor Brenner also mentioned in his talk yesterday, mostly really related to the length of manufacturing that also means that the product is patient-specific, and with that comes the, the problem with, uh, with access and um, um, cost, etc., that we, we discussed earlier this morning. So for these reasons, there's been a lot of um, interest in looking for uh, alternative immune effectors as um, uh, off-the-shelf therapies. You had um, Asal Gil's presentation yesterday on macrophages, and uh, we were especially uh, interested in using natural killer cells as a source of uh, allergenic product, such that you could really use one donor to manufacture potentially tens if not hundreds of doses, allowing for uh, rapid access to therapy, reducing costs, and obviously treating many more patients. So what are natural killer cells? I always like to say NK cells are the step cousin to T cells. Um, they, they have a killing machinery that's very similar to T cells, but also a number of unique characteristics that make them particularly attractive for cell therapy. They're part of our innate immune system. The phenotype, typically, they express CD56. They lack CD3 expression. But the reason they're particularly attractive for cell therapy is unlike allergenic T cells, allergenic NK cells don't cause graft versus host disease, even if totally uh, HLA mismatched with the recipient, even if actually taken across species in xenograft models. And also in case cells on their surface express an array of receptors, these are germline encoded. They could be either activating or inhibitory. As the name uh, suggests, the activating receptors uh, give a positive signal to NK cells to kill the inhibitory receptors, give a negative signal to NK cells not to kill. And it's the balance of these activating and the inhibitory receptors that will ultimately determine if an NK cell is going to kill its target. And NK cells are really really um, a first line of defense that we have against viruses and, uh, and, and, and cancerous cells. So if I can very briefly take you through that, 
When an NK cell uh, comes into contact with a normal cell, the inhibitory NK receptor, which is designed to recognize HLA class 1, and as you know, HLA class 1 is expressed on almost all normal cells, will engage to the class 1, give a negative signal to the NK cell not to kill, even if the activating receptor has recognized uh, uh, an activating uh, ligand on the surface of normal cell. Um, Many of the activating ligands are not known, although the ones that have been uh, described are, are stress molecules that are often uh, expressed on the surface of cells as a result of DNA damage. What happens in the setting of, a, of a, either a viral, virally infected cell or a cancer cell where the, the cancer cell down regulates or loses HLA class 1 on its surface, now when the NK cell comes into contact, there is no interaction of the inhibitory receptor, there's no inhibitory ligand for it uh, to bind, and the NK cell now through its activating ligand can give a, a, a positive signal to the NK cell to kill and destroy the cancer cell. So for these reasons, we, we believe that there are certain advantages to using NK cells for car therapy. As I men mentioned, allergenic NK cells don't cause graft-versus-host disease, so they could be potentially off the shelf. Uh, thereby reducing cost. The killing can be mediated, oops, sorry. The killing can be mediated through some of their, uh, their activating receptors. For instance, uh, the natural cytotoxicity receptors, NKG2D, et cetera, in addition to the CAR that you introduce. Again, theoretically, maybe reducing the risk of relapse as a result of target antigen loss. And um, um, now there's a lot of data both with non-engineered as well as engineered NK cells, that for reasons that we don't quite fully understand, NK cells don't cause cytokine release syndrome and they don't cause um, eye cancer. So they're actually incredibly safe. Um, and a number of year, um, years ago now, back in 2020, we published our data with the first in human trial of uh, current case cell therapy in patients with lymphoid malignancy. So this was um, uh, in case cells that we manufactured from umbilical cord blood. So at MD Anderson, we're fortunate enough to have our own cord blood bank with over 30,000 units of uh, cord blood frozen and characterized, and that was established by my friend and colleague, Dr. Spahr. So what we do is we take the NK cells, we expand them with feeder cells, which we call UAPC, and these are K562-based feeders that express uh, membrane-bound IL-21, 41BB ligand, and CD48 on their surface, together with IL-2. And then we transduce the cell with the retroviral vector that was actually kindly um, uh, sh uh, shared with us by Dr. Pietro Dotti when he was at Baylor College of Medicine, and, and uh, Pietro's now at the University of North Carolina, and this was a tronic vector that encoded for um, the, the CAR-19 with signaling through CD28 and CD3 zeta. Now, one problem with NK cells is that mature NK cells, just, just traditional normal mature NK cells in the absence of cytokines, only have a high lifespan of two weeks, two to three weeks. So this vector also included a cytokine gene, interleukin-15, that's very important for NK proliferation and persistence. And it also included a suicide switch based on inducible caspase-9 that actually Malcolm and his group published on a number of um, years ago in the New England Journal, demonstrating that cells that are... Um, uh, that express inducible caspase 9 with the addition of a small uh, molecule dimerizer can be um, uh, induced to undergo apoptosis within a few hours. So, so we were especially interested in having this suicide switch because at the time, um, cytokine, um, uh, cytokine engineered and cells hadn't been infused into patients yet. So we uh, treated um, uh, the, the phase one portion of the, the trial, which was a dose escalation study, where we treated 11 patients. We, um, report, we observed that seven, percent, seven, seven uh, out of 11 patients achieved a complete remission. Uh, of note, there were no cases of CRS, no neurotoxicity, and despite the fact that the umbilical cord blood and the NK cells, as a result, were HLA mismatched with the recipient, we didn't see any cases of GVHD, even in situations where the degree of HLA mismatch was, uh, was 100%.
And this is an example of a patient with rictus transformation um, who basically went on to achieve a CR uh, of, of his lymph nodes, at least the FDG avid disease um, uh, at day 30. What was very notable to us was that we could detect the, uh, the current cases at low level by qPCR for uh, now, actually, we have data up, unto, up until 18 months after infusion, and this is in spite of the fact that there was HLA mismatch between the donor and the recipient. So the phase two portion of this trial is now complete. Um, we are analyzing uh, the data. I'm hoping that very soon we will be submitting a paper for uh, publication. At the time when we um, submitted this paper, uh, we couldn't really... Um, and make any comments on the duration of the response. And the reason for that was many of the patients who achieved the response went on to receive consolidation, either with a transplant or with additional um, uh, targeted therapies. In the second part of the study, the phase two portion, we amended the trial so that patients didn't receive consolidation. And what I can tell you is that we have a number of patients now who are a year after receiving only one infusion of the CAR and K cells, and they have maintained um, that remission. So this was the, uh, the product that was licensed out to Takeda, and they are about to start a phase two multicenter study of, of this product. And, uh, you know, the safety and potential therapeutic efficacy of CAR and K cells has been demonstrated by others. So this is data that was presented at ASH by Fate Therapeutics, where they infuse into patients in K cells that were derived from uh, induced pluripotent stem cells. And these NK cells were um, engineered to express CAR-19. Here they had a membrane band, IL-15, um, uh, that was fused to the IL-15 receptor and they also had a non-cleavable CD16 to allow for antibody-dependent cellular cytotoxicity. And again, at their highest dose level of 300 million, they, they, uh, they reported kind of response rates in the region of 72%. And this was a frozen product, multiple infusions. More recently, also another company, Encarta, um, presented the, the data in the form of a press release, again, a 50% response rate in, with their CAR-19 in K cells, but also of, of, of um, some um, uh, potential significance. They also uh, reported a CR rate, a CR um, rates of around um, 50, um, well, actually at their highest dose level um, of three out of four patients with AML with NKG2D CAR. So I think there are more and more data coming out on the potential um, efficacy and certainly the safety of, of this um, uh, approach. So we were based on, 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 on uh, our initial data with CAR and K cells, then we were interested in looking and see how we can uh, expand this beyond uh, CD19. For us, really targeting CD19 with CAR and K cells was kind of like a proof of principle. At the time when we started the trial back in 2016, we knew that CD19 was the best antigen to, to go after, and we, we just wanted to know whether NK cells work or not. So once we showed that proof of principle, then now we're very interested in taking it beyond so, you know, I've, taught, I've, I've talked to you about uh, response, but what are the mechanisms of resistance? Obviously, our patients do, do progress, and some patients uh, fail, fail to respond. So, again, we went and looked at the CAR-T uh, literature, and certainly, at least with CAR-T cells, it's been shown that some of the commonest mechanisms of, uh, um, of uh, relapse are CAR-T exhaustion, uh, antigen loss, and, and, and a hostile tumor microenvironment. So so what I would like to, to talk about um, later in the talk is, is, is the tumor microenvironment. But before that, there was this very interesting paper that came out of Michelle Sutherland's uh, lab um, uh, back in uh, 2020, 2019 or 2020, where they described progocytosis as a, a, a mechanism of um, tumor antigen escape. So what's trogocytosis? When, a, um, when an immune effector, let's say a CAR T cell comes into contact with the tumor cell, uh, the tumor cell is killed, yes, 
but uh, the T cell can also take up the, the, the cognate antigen and express it on the surface. So now your CAR T cells also start expressing CD19. This means that the, the, the CAR T cells now can themselves become a target for... Um, for, for CAR T recognition. I mean, this is how uh, fratricide can actually uh, occur. So the two consequences is that by, by really biting off the cognate antigen, you get low tumor antigen density on the surface of the cancer cell, but also you get induced self-recognition and fratricide. So Ethan uh, Lee, a very talented uh, graduate student in my lab, um, ask the question, does the same thing happen with current K cells? Do we see trogocytosis? So basically, in the in vivo model of, again, Raji tumor, where current K cells were infused and the animals were um, sacrificed at, at regular time points and, and their blood um, and, and, and um, organs um, studied, what um, Ethan uh, demonstrated was that um, uh, the NK cells, as you can see here, express uh, on this Tisney plot, they express CAR in green, but also they start expressing CD19 here in orange. And this increases over time. So the, the CAR19 NK cells are also cap capable of uh, uptaking CD19 antigen on their surface. And this is associated with loss of downregulation of CD19 expression on the tumor cells and, uh, and, uh, and uh, ultimately also exhaustion of the CAR19 NK cells. As you can see here, they start upregulating TIGIT, KLRG1, uh, PD1, and they end up losing many of the uh, transcription factors and, uh, and signaling molecules. Uh, so what we think is happening is when the NK cell, your CAR19 NK cell, comes into contact with a CD19 expressing cancer cell, uh, the, the cancer cell is killed, but also uh, the, the NK cells can uptake CD19 on their surface. And now these CD19 expressing NK cells can become a target of recognition by CAR19 NK cells and fratricide. So then how can we overcome this? So to overcome this, we, we, we went back to really the, the, the basic biology of NK cells. If you recall, I mentioned that NK cells on their surface have these inhibitory receptors, and the inhibitory signal is very, very strong. It actually trumps that of the activating uh, uh, signal. So what Ethan did was he... Um, he developed a logic-gated uh, CAR approach, uh, this time targeting RAL1 as a cancer antigen, where we have an activating CAR directed against RAL1 expressed on many solid tumors linked to the activating signal, but also an inhibitory CAR directed against an NK-specific antigen, in this case, CS1. So here, the, the theory or our hypothesis was that if you have an NK cell that expresses both the activating CAR against RAL1 and the inhibitory CAR against CS1, and this CAR NK cell comes into contact with a cancer cell that expresses RAL1 on the surface, well, the NK cell will get the, the, the positive signal through, through RAL1 CAR and will kill the, uh, the, the cancer cell. Uh, the inhibitory CAR doesn't have anything to engage with because the cancer cell doesn't express CS1. However, when now uh, your NK cell, that is again expressing activating RAL1 and inhibitory uh, CS1 CAR, comes into contact with an NK cell that has, is expressing RAL1 through trogocytosis and naturally expresses CS1. CS1, as I mentioned, is an antigen that's expressed on nearly all NK cells. Despite engagement of the activating RAL1 CAR with the RAL1 uh, cognate, um, the, the inhibitory signal will prevent uh, killing of, of the NK cell. And so we hypothesize that this approach will probably then reduce the risk of fratricide, reduce the exhaustion, and result in better outcomes uh, in vivo. And in fact, that's exactly what we saw, where you put just it, the activating RAL1 without uh, an inhibitory signal linked to CS1. In this ovarian cancer model, the tumor really is not 
well controlled. Whereas when you, you use this uh, dual activating inhibitory car, um, the, the tumor is very well controlled. And, and this paper was just accepted um, for publication in Nature Medicine. So can we circum circumvent the immunosuppressive tumor microenvironment? So here we're specifically interested in going after um, uh, glioblastoma. Um, now targeting um, solid tumors is a challenge because of lack of uh, tumor-specific um, antigens, the heterogeneous uh, expression of obviously um, um, uh, tumor antigens, limited tra trafficking to tumor sites, and limited T cell um, persistence. And, and especially with GBM, the, only, uh, the other problem is that many of these patients are on steroids. So there is also the problem of iatrogenic uh, immunosuppression. So uh, what we collaborated with our neurosurgeons to look at NK cells in the uh, uh, primary tumor tissue of glioblastoma patients. And uh, we compared it to that of healthy control NK cells and proof of blood NK cells. This is single cell RNA-seq. And on this UMAP, you can see that tumor infiltrating NK cells look very different to, uh, to healthy control NK cells or proof of blood NK cells. And by CITOF, when we looked at expression of various markers, we showed that the tumor infiltrating NK cells fail to express many of the activating receptors they don't actually have expression of much of the signaling molecules. And uh, in addition, um, what we also found is that they seem to have the signature of a TGF-beta. And indeed, when we looked at these tumor infiltrating NK cells, we could see that they had evidence of constitutive activation of TGF-beta TGF as shown by phosphorylation of SMAD2 and 3, two proteins important for um, TGF-beta signaling. And these tumor infiltrating NK cells were incapable of killing targets in vitro. This to us suggested that we could potentially um, use this um, mechanism as a therapeutic, uh, uh, as a, a therapeutically using CRISPR gene editing, but not by knocking out the TGF beta receptor on NK cells, we could potentially make them resistant to. Um, to the effect of TGF beta in the tumor microenvironment and in, in these PDX models of glioblastoma, where we injected the mice with patient derived glioblastoma stem cell lines, you can see that. Um, NK cells initially very transiently control the tumor, but then all the animals succumb to disease, but the TGF beta receptor 2 knockout NK cells control the tumor very nicely. And uh, since, as I mentioned, uh, patients are also on corticosteroids, we also went on to knock out the, NR, the, the um, gene for the glucocorticoid receptor called NR3C1. And we demonstrated that the dual knockout uh, NR3C1 and TGF-beta receptor uh, to knock out NK cells could control the tumor very nicely. So this approach is now being translated to the clinic um, where we will be a dose escalation uh, study of intratumoral injection of NK cells um, in patients with uh, glioblastoma. This has received um, FDA, uh, um, ethics approval and is currently with the FDA. Okay, so I've shown that car engineering allows for redirection of antigen specificity, enhanced persistent by, persistence by incorporating a cytokine gene, but car engineering is also very expensive and technically challenging. So then we hypothesized that maybe we can pre-complex our NK cells with a bispecific antibody to redirect their antigen specificity to make them have car-like responses. And that maybe we can enhance the persistence of NK cells by pre-activating them with cytokines such as IL-12, 15, 18, rather than um, putting a cytokine gene in there and thereby induce a memory phenotype. So NK cells are part of the innate immune system, but uh, having said that, over the last 15 years or so, there's increasing evidence that under certain circumstances, NK cells can acquire memory. For instance, when NK cells are exposed to viruses, but also when NK cells are exposed to um, inflammatory cytokines that normally are dendritic cells produced, such as IL-12, 15, and 18. And that was shown to, in to result in increased increased proliferation persistence and increased capacity of NK cells to, uh, to release interferon uh, gamma. 
Preclinically, uh, Lucilla Curb, I showed that if you take your cold blood and K cells and preactivate them with R12, 15, and 18 prior to expansion, this results in upregulation up of um, um, the pathways related to JAK start and interferon gamma signaling. And in, in mass models, then, if you take these preactivated and expanded in K-cells and then you pre-complex them with a, a bispecific antibody, so in this case, AFM13, which binds CD16 on the surface of in K-cells and CD30 on cancer cells, you can induce uh, car-like uh, responses here, as you can see. So just to summarize, I think we have shown you that current K-cells can, can, can obviously result in really impressive responses and their safety. We can go and uh, make them um, resistant to the, tumor, to the tumor microenvironment using CRISPR gene editing. But ultimately, I think for those hard-to-treat diseases such as solid tumors, we will have to uh, take a, an, a combinatorial strategy, maybe with CARs, with cytokine engineering, with uh, combination with checkpoints and maybe even combination with antibodies. So lots of people to thank, uh, the brilliant scientists and postdocs in my lab, my colleagues at MD Anderson, I mentioned EJ already, uh, funding agencies, especially the MD Anderson Moonshot program, and, uh, and of course our patients and their caregivers for uh, putting their trust in us and, and uh, taking part in our studies. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.